Hey, GM Jim here from the future. Real quick, I'm doing an awesome giveaway this week. Stay tuned to the end of this video or check the pinned comment down below for info on how you can enter and increase your chances of winning after you enter. Now, here's your video. So the other day, I got a comment on one of my videos that asked about rebalancing encounters or entire adventures for small parties or one-on-one D&D. Thanks to Match Mat Matches Mal Matches Mal Ma Sorry, I'm terrible with Leet. Anyway, I responded with a couple of suggestions for how to even the odds, but this got me thinking. There has to be a solid way to reliably and accurately rebalance adventure content without doing a ton of work. That last part is key. How can we adopt a low effort strategy here to do this without having to spend inordinate amounts of time? Sly Flourish talked about running one-on-one D&D, and he said he basically had to change encounters so there was always one monster versus one PC. I can see how that is an easy way to simplify the math, so you could do that and call it done. You would use an equation like one creature of a CR of about one quarter to one half of the PC's level. So one level one PC versus one kobold or maybe one goblin. One level two PC versus one knoll or maybe even one bugbear. And while this will work, as the commenter notes, 1v1 can become stale. And you're going to have to watch out for anything that would cause swinginess problems for the action economy, like enemies who can poison the PC. If your PC is suddenly attacking with disadvantage every round, that's potentially a quick route to a TPK. Same with an enemy who could stun your PC for a round or more. At low levels, missing a single turn could be deadly. I do have some experience in this area. While most written adventures by Wizards of the Coast and other 5e publishers are designed for a party of four characters, I've run lots of D&D with smaller parties. My Wizards and Wordslingers group of authors have usually been only three PCs, and I ran the bulk of Wild Beyond the Witchlight for only two PCs. So let's look at some examples here for how to handle small parties. In Watsi's Book of Many Things, there's a one-shot written for four 8th level characters, but they include guidelines for how to balance for other party comps or lower levels. I wish more adventures did this, you know, give you guidelines for how to increase or decrease any challenge. In this adventure, they advise doing some simple things like adding temporary hit points to the PCs, and the obvious method of reducing the number of enemies, replacing monsters with lower CRs, giving the baddies disadvantage on attack rolls, etc. And these things could work, but we want to avoid all the hassle. There has to be an easier solution, one that doesn't require major reworking of the number or types of monsters. So, here are six ways you can rebalance an adventure for a party of one or two PCs without doing a ton of work. The first option is to make the PCs stronger. That's something like the aforementioned free false life spell, or another good option is powerful magic items. If you give your wizard an amulet of health, then their hit points won't be much of a problem. Give that first level fighter a flame tongue sword and they'll dish out enough DPS to take on multiple kobolds. You can also simply over-level the PCs. If you've got a first to fifth level adventure, start them at level three. And while you're at it, give them a homebrew magic item that allows them a free action surge at proficiency bonus times per long rest. Your players will never complain about getting to do more cool and powerful things at low levels. The next three ways all have to do with using NPCs, and I'm going to give them to you in order of worst to best. Here we go. The next method, and the worst in my opinion, is using one or more DM PCs. And this is the worst option because the DM PC has long been a cautionary tale for good reason. When the DM's PC lands the killing blow, the players tend to feel not great about it. It's a little agency robbing to see the DM rolling dice against themselves and taking all the glory. I'm operating a DM PC in my home game right now, basically because a PC died, and so I gave that PC's player a new character to pilot while the party went on a resurrection mission. Once the resurrection happened and the player got his old PC back, the party didn't want that temporary character to leave. So I decided to play the PC, at least for now, until there's a dramatically appropriate moment to kill him off or have him leave for some other reason. And the way I deal with this is that the DMPC really only acts when the party suggests something. I'll say, what do you guys want Reggie to do here? In combat, I'll say things like, should Reggie try to web them with his spider staff or just attack? This puts more of the agency back into their hands, but it's still not ideal. 
The third option is to use sidekicks. In 5e, Tasha's Cauldron of Everything gives us rules to create simplified character classes of expert, spellcaster, and warrior. The book even says, a player plays the sidekick as their second character, ideal when you only have one or two players. Now, the book does say that any creature of a CR with one half or lower can be a sidekick, but we're talking here about humanoid sidekicks, the elf squire from town, the gnome hireling from the monastery, etc. The idea here is that if you have one PC who is a fighter, then you also create a sidekick who's complementary like a spellcaster, most likely a healer. And the benefit there, better than using a DM PC, is that the player operates this sidekick in combat. The player is making all the choices, and since the sidekick uses a simplified stat block, it shouldn't be as difficult as operating multiple PCs. Out of combat, the DM operates the sidekick for roleplay, making it feel more like a party of adventurers. The player rolls for perception checks and stealth checks for that sidekick, but the DM does the voice. Sidekicks have rules for leveling, so they can stick around and stay useful in combat or exploration segments throughout the entire adventure. The fourth option, and my personal favorite of the three NPC-based options, is the Beast Companion Sidekick. And what I like about this as an option is that it's the most simple. Pick a beast or another low to average intelligence creature with melee focused capabilities, not spellcasting. Give your level 1 fighter a CR1 direwolf and they will harmonize really well in combat. The direwolf attacks first and knocks the enemy prone, then the fighter melee attacks that same creature with advantage. Super simple and effective. A beast companion doesn't have leveling built in, but we can add that without too much fuss. Just increase their hit dice at the same rate as the player and give them an extra attack at level 5 and probably another one at level 11. You can swap out the beast for a better one at higher levels, or if the player becomes attached to their companion, which they probably will, you can find other ways to buff them. Upgrade that pet drake with magical claw attachments that let them add poison damage to each attack. Your player will probably want to find or make armor for them to increase their AC. And who wouldn't want to go full Lyra Silvertongue and have an armored bear at your side? That's dope as hell. The double-edged sword here with a beast helper versus a regular sidekick is the lack of a voice in the RP. Your direwolf isn't going to help you verbally negotiate with the town guard. Your direwolf is mostly a combat companion. So just talk to your player about which kind they would prefer, which one is going to make the game easier and faster to run. I have a young son, and playing a direwolf or owlbear has always been a good option for him. It's just more simple than worrying about classes and spellcasting. The next option is multiple PCs per player. I don't love this option, but it's out there. I remember my first time ever playing D&D, I had begged my older brother for months to run a game for me. When he finally relented, we sat down and all I remember was having four character sheets in front of me, frantically scanning them going, uh, uh... Uh, it was a lot, especially for a new player. Side note, when I was a kid, all I wanted was to be a wizard with a pseudo-dragon familiar. It wasn't until I was an adult that it finally happened when I played a Pact of the Chain Warlock. I love that character. Anyway, when I played Baldur's Gate 3, I operated four characters at a time with basically no problem. But just be wary of dropping more than one PC on a player unless they can handle it. Our sixth option is adjusting the encounters. Now, I know I started out this video saying this is what we were trying to avoid, but some of this is inevitable. You might have to be more willing to make adjustments on the fly, like deciding that the monster with multi-attack doesn't take its second or third attack in a round. Personally, I tend to err on the side of having the monsters hit hard, but lowering their hit points. That way, fights feel dangerous, but don't last long enough to turn into a slog. A one-on-one -on -one combat is obviously going to move much faster than one with a full party, but you still have to be wary when that PC is going against a big bag of hit points that takes 12 rounds to whittle down to zero. Also consider that since TPKs are more likely with a tiny party, think up some alternatives to TPKs that won't cause the player to have to roll up a new character. When that goblin crits and drops the player's sorcerer to 0 HP, have the green baddie drag the unconscious player back to their camp. So the PC wakes up in the camp and now it's an escape mission. Or give that single PC a patron type NPC character who can rescue them from bad situations at a cost. Always at a cost. Just discuss this with your player in session 0. Maybe they're fine with rolling up new characters often when they die all the time. If so, don't worry about it. 
Another thing to consider here is that party synergies 5e assumes are going to be non-existent. If your PC is a cleric and they have a brown bear sidekick, who's going to be the face of the party? Who's going to scout for traps and pick locks? You don't necessarily need the party to have a charisma character or a sneaky rogue, and you don't have to then remove all the secret doors and locked rooms from an adventure. Here's where magic items come in really handy. In my home game, the party has no rogue, so I gave them gloves of thievery so they can get a boost when picking those locks and doing sleight of hand stuff. It's totally fine if you want to give your cleric a spell scroll of counterspell and just hand wave the level and class requirement. And since necessity is the mother of invention, your players may surprise you with creative solutions to problems created by an apparent lack of certain party comp skills. So there we have six ways to run D&D for one or two players without having to do a ton of work to rebalance everything. Because after all, if you can get away with doing less work, why wouldn't you, right? Right? Hey there, GM Jim from the future again. So I'm doing a giveaway right now, and here's the awesome thing. I'm giving away these rainbow dice. Yeah, here's some pictures. Yes, those could be yours celebrate pride or if you're not into pride just celebrate rainbows because these clear dice that were purchased at a friendly local game store had these cool little rainbow thingies on the inside of them so if you want to enter scan this qr code that should be up here or also look at the pinned comment down below for the link the giveaway is hosted on king sumo's website and here's what you need to know when you enter the giveaway, you have to type in your email address and then click the button in the confirmation email. This is so I can differentiate entries. It does not sign you up to any list. I will not do anything else with your email, I swear on my mother's life. But after you enter, there are other things you can do to increase your chances of winning, which I'll talk about in a second. The giveaway ends on Sunday, June 16th, 2024, and then after that, my giveaway app randomly chooses a winner, and you're notified by email. I'll also name the winner in a YouTube community post on the day after, probably. Then I'll send you your prize. If I have to ship something, it's US only, and I'm sorry about that. But here's the coolest part. In this giveaway, you increase your chances of winning the more you share it. Wait, what? Yes, it's true. You would think for a giveaway, you want fewer people to enter so you have a better odds, right? Well, not with my giveaways. You enter on a point system, and it generates a unique link for you to email to others. There are other things you can do on the giveaway page, like share that unique giveaway link on your socials, or sub to me on YouTube, follow me on Instagram, etc., and stuff like that. Each time you do one of these things, you get additional points. And the more points you have, the higher your chances of winning. It's genius. Ignore the sponsored link at the bottom, I can't remove that. And don't forget to confirm your email, you have to do this to win. So enter at jimheskett.com forward slash contest, confirm, share it, and follow me on all the things to increase the chance you'll win the prize. And if you're watching this in the future, you can still visit the link to see what the most current giveaway is. I'll be running them from time to time. I'm also obligated to tell you that this contest is not affiliated with or sponsored by YouTube in any way. Good luck, and I'll see you soon. Back to you, Jim from the past. Anyway, thanks for watching. Until next time, this is GM Jim. Now go find an easier, softer way.